Hello? 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 This is the Vancouver Commercial with a state podcast. Welcome back to the Vancouver Commercial Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Wright. And I'm your other sometimes host, Matt Scalina. See, I try to change it up every time before I was we gonna do say, I caught you off guard there. Uh, yeah. I caught you off guard there. <laughs> I was practicing in the mirror this morning how I'd get you off guard there. <laughs> Done. Who do we got on the show today, Corey? Today on the show, we have our good friend, Byron Chard, CEO and president of Chard Developments. And today we unpacked everything from the Victoria market all the way to the rental market, where they foresee things going. We even touch base on the office market. And it's always great to get developers insight on where that's going. So it was, uh, I would say, you know, as always, phenomenal episode. I, I agree. You know what? Byron Chart is such a great guest. He's been on the Vancouver Real Estate Podcast, but I always feel like, you know, just the nature of the conversations, we always focus on the residential yeah. side. Chart is such a diversified company. Yeah. And Byron's such a smart guy. It was really interesting getting all his takes on, on what's going on in the commercial world. Well, one thing I think people don't realize about him is, you know, he has an accounting background. So he's probably a very analytical individual to start with coming from that industry. And he goes into that stuff talking about trends and population trends. And then he talks about how, like in their office, they have like a dashboard that tracks this. Like that, that to me is, is next level stuff because, I mean, we read reports and we look at charts. This is the guy charting that stuff. Like yeah. they're, they're, they're that much. And when you look at how much money they're putting into their projects, it makes sense. And I, I mean, I haven't really heard of any, you know, maybe I could be wrong of other groups doing it to that level to what these, what, what Byron is. And it's just, it speaks volumes and it sort of just roadmaps their success for them. Yeah. You know what? I, in my mind, there's a lot of reasons chart is so successful, but that may be yeah. one of the real competitive advantages they have. Well, one thing he talks too about how they, they buy on the fringe and they kind of like almost kind of foresee the trend of maybe where the population's going. And he talks about how they've done that in Vancouver. They've continued to do that in Victoria. I mean, it, it's really impressive stuff. And like I said, it almost makes you really think that, I mean, how much back end work is going in just to make a, a single decision on a piece of land. It was a fantastic talk. So great to have him on the show. Well, it's funny, you know, I, I didn't know if you would be here today or Adam would be here. And I think, you know, one thing they say when, you know, you hang out with somebody or you get married to someone, you start to look like them and talk like them. Yeah. And I had a chance to listen to the edits on the last episode with Mike from Strand before it went out there. And I'm very proud to say that I only said the word phenomenal about two times that I could count, maybe three. Adam, yeah, four and a half, <laughs> four and a half. He is, he, we are becoming <laughs> one and I give him four and a half. Cause I think at one point he actually caught himself and pivoted realizing so well, that that's the word that Corey uses four times an episode. <laughs> so I wanted to say, I am growing on you guys. Yeah, that is uh, phenomenal. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that is phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not actually sure how I feel about that, but, uh, well, I'll, no. I'll give you a word too. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but what else do we have, Corey, before we cut to our talk with Byron? We're always sponsored by our good friends over at Impact Commercial Group with over 50 years of commercial lending experience. For all your commercial lending needs, visit them at impactcommercial.ca. All right. Well, maybe we'll cut to our talk with CEO and president of Chard Developments, Iron Chard. Enjoy, guys. All right, we're here with Byron Chard, CEO and president of Chard Developments. Byron, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks uh, so much, Byron, for taking the time. As always, you've been on the Vancouver Real Estate Podcast. This is your first foray into the Vancouver Commercial Real Estate Podcast, but maybe can you start by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself? I'd be pleased to. So I'll start with uh, who Chard is, and then I can dig into who I am. Um, I always like to put Chard first and foremost. Chard, we're a family developer based in Vancouver. My father started the company around 27 years ago. I took it over approximately three years ago now. Chard is, we have about 11 projects on the go. 
about 80% of our portfolio is Vancouver and 20% on the island that ebbs and flows a bit, uh, depending of our uh, asset classes. And we are approximately 60 to 70% in residential and half of that is rental, half of that is condo. And the remaining percentage there is a mixture of hotels and office development. We are primarily focused on urban centers. And I always like to say that we buy on the fringe. And so, for example, when we bought Ellsworth on Main and 7th back in 2015, people thought we were buying in the, the depth of East Van. And why would we ever buy there? And, I, and Main Street, I think, is now one of the coolest streets in Vancouver. And I like to think that we help shape that and then have fantastic tenants on the retail that also add to that vibrancy. We really focus as a company on quality and experience. And what I mean by experience is that's all the way down our supply chain. And so that's from our subtrades to our consultants, to our purchasers, to our staff. How do we create an experience that is lasting and memorable? And uh, we try to put measures in place to of how many repeat buyers do we get on that? Uh, and I'm quite proud to say that even We've had our, some condo buyers out of Eleanor or even in Victoria buying some of our strata office buildings. Uh, and so wow. that's something I'm really proud of, of how do we create that experience and that uh, reputation where when we launch a project, we have repeat individuals. And that, that's something our team over at Chart is really proud of. And we always strive to hit at least 20% repeat in all of our projects. And if we are able to achieve that, we know we've done something right on the past project. Wow. With regards to myself, um, so I'm an accountant. Uh, please don't hold that against me. Um, <laughs> I uh, went to Western. I went to the Ivy Business School and then worked at Ernst & Young. As I shared on the Vancouver Real Estate Podcast, when I started my career, I was sent down to Dallas to work there for almost two years when uh, Lehman Brothers had recently collapsed. All their real estate funds were sold to a company based in Dallas. And I was frankly privileged to work on this file evaluating those assets. What was supposed to be a two-week assignment turned into a two-year assignment had definitely the travel got to me, but on hindsight, I don't regret it whatsoever. And I would say I only got that experience and continued to get it just because I said yes. When I was young in my career, I raised my hand and said, toss me in, coach, I'm ready. And I would say those sacrificing some of my earlier years of working hard, some late nights, uh, long hours, it was all worth it for the education experience and where it's got me today. And so that's definitely some advice I would give anyone entering their career is be humble, raise your hands and get ready to roll up your sleeves, because that's the only way that you're going to uh, get opportunities or things presented to you with uh, that you wouldn't have otherwise. From there, I worked for another developer in Vancouver, and then I joined the family company here for eight years now. Uh, really had the privilege, again, of working with my father hand in hand. We have a fantastic relationship, never had an argument in our eight years of being in business together. And it really comes from mutual respect. And, and that's where I think Char just operates in general. Is I like to think that we treat everyone fairly, uh, treat people the way that we would like to be treated. And from there, that's really been our basis of our company and, and anyone we look to hire. You know, one thing, Byron, that strikes me about your career before you were at Chard is, you know, you had more than one job after getting your accounting degree was the, you know, and you were working at other places while Chard was already a thriving business. Was there a strategy to that? Like go out and see what everybody else is doing? Or, or were you thinking like, hey, that's, you know, uh, I want to cut my own path here? Or what, what was the, what was the thinking there? I would say it was a really smart strategy for my father is he didn't want to be the one to train me from ground up. Um, he, he, he would, he would like to joke to say, don't take my bad habits um, <laughs> and come in with fresh flair, I'll call it or fresh ideas. But I would say it is really, it is who my father is of letting us. Um, I say us is there's, I have my two sisters as well, chart our own paths. He is very supportive of kind of the path we want to take, figure out who we are. And he's been there to support that. And it wasn't until I approached him and saying, okay, I'm, I'm interested in the family company of joining and, and, and being part of what you have created and so successfully built. And at that point, that's when it organically grew from there. But it was really, I didn't know I wanted to join the company, nor did he ever persuade that or push that on me. He was very patient of, I say, letting me take that initiative to get there. And I think so he was very smart in how he strategically 
approached it. One of the biggest reasons why we wanted to have you on today was, you know, Chard has been a premier developer in Victoria in the Harris Green District, just outside of the downtown core there. And Victoria seems like it's gone through a dramatic change over the past three years and maybe even five years for that matter. What has someone in your position that has built some of the best towers in that marketplace, what have you guys seen in the evolution and the transition of the Victoria market over the past few years? And you mean with the projects that you guys have now, what type of like successes are you experiencing now at maybe an earlier stage that maybe you guys weren't experiencing at this same point, say three or five years ago with some past projects? Well, first off, thank you for those kind words. It's greatly appreciated. It's our goal in Victoria has been to continue to add to the vibrancy of downtown Victoria. Again, we're urban developers and we we truly believe in an integrated community. And that's what downtown has to offer if it's the the restaurants, the shops, the everything in walking distance. And Victoria has definitely become more sophisticated over the years, but the dynamics of it have not changed. Again, I'll I'll reference one of my father's quotes. It's tap on, tap off is what the Victoria market is, and it still is that way. It is just that the tap flows a little bit more steady um, or stronger when it's tap on. And so what we mean by that statement is that the buyers definitely come in waves. And typically, it is more of that traditional sales cycle if it's the spring or the fall. We did have a good, a strong July this year, a little bit more traditional August from a pre-sale standpoint, but July was definitely strong and we have a really strong September with strong traffic in our presentation centers right now. But it is, Victoria has gone through a lot more growth from the investment standpoint where people are recognizing the population growth is outpacing Vancouver and quite frankly, most of Canada. I think if I get my numbers correct here, the year-over-year growth right now in Victoria is roughly 1.52%, while like Vancouver is 1.06, and then you have BC, uh, which is just below a one. And so from there, like it's the growth. Victoria is growing almost double the pace as Vancouver right now. I think affordability, lifestyle, work from home, as well as the economy in Victoria have major impacts on that immigration cycle in Victoria is also very different than Vancouver compared to Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, which are the main international immigration spots. Victoria is one of the hottest Canadian immigration from an interprovincial standpoint, and especially from a Metro Vancouver standpoint coming over to the island. That is really due to climate is a major driver there. Uh, The stigma of nearly dead or newly wed is no longer the case. Uh, We sell to a lot of individuals in their 35 to 45 who have established careers and they're looking to start off a business to move their business over. And we have a lot of executives that actually have moved over to the island during COVID as well due to the family lifestyle, but also due because of transportation become easier. And so what we've seen in the Victoria market is really sophistication sophistication from the buyers, from the individuals who want to live there, as well as the economy in general. And really, that's where we've had to step up and have to stay nimble if we want to remain a a dominant player in the Victoria, a city of Victoria market, I'll call it. Current project you guys have on sale right now is sort of at the top of the Harris Green District there, sort of border of, I guess, Fairfield and Harris Green, the nest, along with your uh, Haven project there. Right now, and correct me if I'm wrong, we don't have a shovel in the ground yet get going down, although the building's under being deconstructed. Right now, from a sales perspective on the nest, from a percentage, and if you're comfortable sharing, where are you at right now with that project and what percentage has been sold at this stage? And maybe we can compare that directly to say the Yates on Yates building on the 800 block, maybe at a similar point. Are you guys have much more sold at this stage than maybe you did with that last tower? And what type of units are selling in the nest versus maybe that was different than, say, you were seeing at the Yates at the same stage? Great question. It's Do do you want my performer as well? If I I can can give you that. Well, well, hey, I'm not going to say no. Any any inside information you want to share, you got my office address. (laughs) No, as uh, as Corey, as you know, uh, we've done many many transactions together. I'm an honest and a transparent individual. That's how we operate our business. It's a true philosophy of what I live by. So right now at the Nest, we're around 40% sold. Wow. Um, we started sales roughly four months ago. 
So we're in a really strong position from our pre-sale standpoint. Again, we had great traction off the front from our repeat buyers. We typically sell almost 20% of our building just uh, within the first week or two to repeat buyers. And if I find that they're not just investors, about 30 to 40% of them are actually owner users. And maybe they were an investor in the past building, but now they're looking to downsize into that two-bedroom. And So of how we design our suites is we design them to attract anyone and everyone. Because Victoria is a small market, absorption is slower. You can't just design a building to the investors or to the owner users uh, when you have 100 plus units. You have to design it to appeal to all demographic and affordability ranges. And so that's exactly what we've achieved in our sales to date. Three out of four of our penthouses are sold, while a lot of our one bedrooms and our price points are sold. And so what we've seen is that we, the downsizers or the owner users are looking for the two bedrooms, a little bit more space. Uh, a little bit more outdoor space. And we're seeing that with our larger one bedrooms as well. And then our smaller one bedrooms are going to those investors who see that opportunity because rental rates are so strong on the island. Yeah. Um, and because vacancy is one of the lowest in Canada on the island as well. On how it compares to past projects, Yates was 2017. So that was a very strong market uh, when we launched. So it's hard to compare to that project. But in comparison to all of our other pre-sales, normally it takes us eight to nine months in Victoria to achieve 25% sold. And we always position with our financial partners that we go into the ground at 25%. We've never not delivered on a project that we've started or even bought on the island. Yep. Uh, and so for us, we always put a shovel in the ground once we hit 25%. And, and that's what we're doing next week at Yates. We hit that milestone. And for us, uh, we hit it fairly quickly. So we're scrambling to get that shovel in the ground and start building these much needed homes. That's amazing. You know, Byron, every time we talk about different markets, and uh, I may have asked this question to you before, so forgive me if that's the case, but, you know, the path along the lake in Kelowna is, you know, their seawall type thing. Is the Harris Green District Main Street in Victoria? It's becoming Main Street. It's becoming a great mixture of residential, commercial, and office. I wouldn't compare it to Lakeside on the island, but I would compare it close to Stanley Park almost in from a Vancouver standpoint or close to Queen Elizabeth. Or maybe it might be a better example because you're, you're close to walking distance to Beacon Hill. Uh, you're close to a little bit more Fairfield where it's more neighborhood feel uh, comparison to the core of downtown. Um, and so it, it's a great transition. We like to say it's where uh, the best neighborhoods meet because you're right on the border of Fairfield and downtown. And so I think it's that lifestyle component, which of that more neighborhood feel, which is the draw. One thing that we look at too, and we're, we're sort of looking at it, you know, obviously you have a better insight than say most people, but we're looking at it from like a, a commercial brokerage standpoint is we're comparing it to maybe an upcoming sort of Yale town type area, just based on the density. Our office recently just opened in the uh, bottom of one of Byron's last projects, the Vivid at the Yates, our, our new Victoria office is open in the base there now. And even I've been really surprised to see the demographic and primarily the age of the people that are coming and going from the Yates on Yates and the Vivid at the Yates, a lot younger than I probably anticipated. And I want to say a lot more professionals than I probably would have anticipated in a good way, just seeing the demographic of it. And I think when you look at like how Yale Town kind of built out and you got these really, really dense neighborhood with great street side retail, I kind of look at the Harris Green District as kind of emerging into that. Primarily because even in downtown, you've got so much heritage down there. You don't really have the ability to really develop a lot of downtown, even if you wanted to. So I think a lot of people are getting pushed into that that marketplace. How do you guys foresee or from a comparable standpoint, is there a, a market there that you look at that we think this is what the Harris Green will be done? Where when it's all said and done, this is how we envision it's going to sort of look like or a comparable market maybe to over here? I think your analogy to Yale Town is an excellent one. I also think, though, it's how we position the buildings. Um, And so Vivid, for example, and this is where I've had my success as a developer, is was a unique partnership and financial structure from a developing, from a construction loan standpoint with BC Housing. And so that was a a project sold at 10% below market to get individuals into homeownership. And so that's where we, we have really pushed that younger demographic. I would say I'm a younger leader myself and really tailored to the social need of moving individuals up the housing continuum. Uh, And that's where we, why that vivid is that younger professional demographic, because that's exactly who we targeted on that project and 
I'm really quite proud of Vivian and our team. I think that's one of them, uh, the buildings that our team is most proud of for all those individuals we help get into the market. But if, uh, I would, I, I do like your analogy of Yale Town, just because you can get the density um, and we can see those pocket parts in future development starting to shape up. We have a muse in our nest and haven development uh, in the middle there next to an office building. So it's these integrated uses and also integrated housing types. So we have the rental, we have affordable home ownership, we have market condo. Because of this diversity, we're seeing the vibrance of the community. And I think that's the key component and, and one of my biggest frustrations when working with different municipalities. We get told that we just want rental. We just want social housing. We just want these single standalone types. That's not what's going to make a community flourish. Yeah. We need all types. And that's where you need to sub- give that supply chain of that full housing continuum. Otherwise, we're going to have issues decades down the road. You know, just thinking about trying to get a handle on the the market you, you mentioned a few minutes back Byron about you know the the rental rates in Victoria and how attractive they are char development owns purpose built rental in in both Vancouver and Victoria can you talk a little bit about how the market dynamics and how those markets are similar but different absolutely so uh, the rental demographic person we build high quality condo like rental buildings it is one of my biggest frustrations and, quite frankly, nervousness going into public hearings now or community engagement. I think rental is thought of as a second-class house from a lot of individuals, which is completely incorrect. It is a different lifestyle than home ownership, and that mindset needs to be respected. And that's one of my biggest frustrations in going through community consultation right now is is hearing those type of comments. Because instead of someone investing into their real estate as their primary savings for retirement, they're investing into stocks or bonds or other ways. And that's maybe why they're renting. It's a different approach from there, or they are more transient. And that's what we see a lot more in Vancouver in our renters is they, they are transient individuals in some of these newer properties that we're building. They have just moved to Vancouver. We have a lot of Amazon employees, for example, a lot of healthcare professionals on the North Shore in our building, uh, and they've recently moved to the Vancouver area. The other one that we see on a North Shore rental building that we've just hit stabilization on is that we have a lot of people who are moving to the North Shore for lifestyle. And so they they no longer want to be in the Yale Town or the West End or even Coquitlam we had a lot of people move from. And they wanted to be on the North Shore, being close proximity to the mountains, or and some of them actually live and work on the North Shore. As you know, traffic is a hot topic on the North Shore. But by offering that rental, they're actually able to move closer to where they live and work. They're able to walk or take a bike there instead. And so again, adding that housing supply, I truly do think it will help alleviate the bridge traffic and those different components. It definitely it's a unique dynamic of adding more homes. But if these individuals are living and playing on the North Shore, they're already coming over any which way. On the island, what we see in the the renter pool, it is an interesting dynamic right now. And why I say that, we we do see the interprovincial individuals moving to the island, testing it out. We do definitely see a lot of the young professionals in the rental environment. We do see students out of UVic as well. The one that I think has been taking a really interesting turn is the speculation tax. And so because of so many individuals from Alberta, Ontario, like to go to Victoria for a few months of the year, and they're no longer able to buy or they don't want to because of the speculation tax. However, that means they are renting. And so they they are renting that unit out for the year, but they want that permanent location to always go and have that place to go and, and call it a second home. And it's an interesting turn that I did not see originally when the speculation came out, but we're definitely starting to see that trend now. Recently in the news, your acquisition in Victoria of the uh, the White Spot site there. Where do you guys see Victoria going? And what type of projects maybe do you have in the pipeline over there that you can share at this point? And maybe you know a sort of a follow-up to that is, is there any asset class in maybe the greater Victoria area that you guys aren't currently in, but it is something that Chart is looking deeper into just maybe based on the success you've already had in that market? So we are remained urban builders and that was the strategy behind the the white spot site again when we buy on the fringe of what we call it the, the yeah. white spot site is i would call on the fringe of downtown is right beside where town line has done a fantastic job with their hudson master plan redevelopment and for us 
It is a strategic buy to continue to expand the downtown. We are currently in the midst of refining our development, and I'm, I'm quite excited of what we're progressing and what we have in the works and the diversity of houses that we're going to provide there, as well as community benefits and public plaza. I think it will be a welcome addition by the community and then look forward to working with the community to refine it um, as we get their feedback of what they want to see more. A big part of what we do in designing is talking to the neighborhood, um, talking to local stakeholders of what is important. And it also includes talking to the different right holders as well of just of the property of the land of just what is what are the needs of the people. With regards to our other future projects, we do have a hotel development in downtown Victoria that we are going to public hearing on September 23rd. This is a really exciting project for Char that we've had in the works since 2016 which is also a heritage revitalization project. And for us, this is a an opportunity to continue to add and spur on and to support the economy of Victoria. And so that's a really exciting project that we would be working with Hyatt Hotels on and bringing a, real, a lifestyle brand concept so we could tailor the interior design and the experience to the consumer, to the local Victoria old town market. Uh, and I think it's something I'm quite excited on to add to Victoria and the, the great history that the site has. And to answer your last question, because that was a fully loaded question you asked there, Corey. Yeah, we try uh, to cram as much as we can. In <laughs> well, and so uh, the other asset classes, I have no light industrial. I would love light industrial close to the core of Victoria. We, we don't, we've never played in Langford before. Like your past speaker is currently building there. So, so we we haven't played out in that area, and nor do we have plans to. I think there's people who know that market better than we do, and so we don't try to compete with uh, individuals who might know that better. We we know downtown Victoria very well. We know each street, we know each corner that we want to be on, and so for that reason, we like to stay in the Vancouver area with Polk to Sydney or Squamalt out in those areas where we can add that quality housing experience into those neighborhoods as well. You know, one thing that strikes me, Byron, is especially in light of, you know, focusing in on it, neighborhoods that, that you know, is how diverse Chart is. You know, you're doing purpose-built rental, you're doing condos, you're in office space, you know, hotels. Can you talk a little bit about why your company's so diverse, but also how you kind of manage those different classes and, and, and making sure you're, you know, you're on top of them, you understand them and, and you're successful? We've always been a very opportunistic company. We see an opportunity in this. How do we look at the property? And so quite frankly, it's what is our upbringing? So my father, when he started, he was in commercial. He was in offices as well as malls. So his experience is commercial. When I started my career at EY, it was also on the commercial side. I learned the residential through my father and through osmosis from that front and just delivering that high quality experience. And I would say residential is a lot more detail-oriented, a lot more components that are involved in it. We find commercial and retail is a lot more strategic on the economy standpoint. And so we have a great finance team at Charge who spends a lot of time looking at different trends that we do work with. A few companies here of, I'd say, created almost dashboards so we can follow what the economy, demographics, immigration, what stats are putting out. Um, and we've almost created an in-house dashboard of what the economy is changing. And, and so instead of reading all these reports, we can easily actually just look at it real live data. And so that's uh, something that's been really useful. I know our partners quite enjoy that we are able to have that at top of mind always and be able to provide it. For us to stay nimble on the design side, we work with great consultants. It, real estate comes down to people. I love this industry because we're left with something tangible, but we get to work with so many different people and the creativity that everyone gets to bring to the table. If it's from finance, if it's to design, if it's to work with the city, everyone gets to bring in a different layer to the project. And I would say that's where we've been able to stay diverse, stay nimble, and ultimately never put ourselves into a corner because we can always adjust a use of a project. And it's how we look at it to maximize the value for our partners and, and basically position the building to benefit the community the most in the long long run. Earlier, you offered me your performa. What are the chances I can come over and get a picture of that dashboard? <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> 
this is as you were saying that I was like, man, this is unbelievable information. I have an in-house team producing the real live data. Like that is incredible. And it's why I knew what those uh, immigration population numbers were from Victoria, Vancouver, and BC so quickly. <laughs> I, I was thinking for a second, I'm like, man, this guy really prepped. Now I know so you're looking out your office at a dashboard. <laughs> <laughs> So what's, what's next for Chart? What, I mean, you guys have obviously been, you know, you guys have made great strides in the development world with some really, really prominent and key projects, you know, over the Lower Mainland and even Vancouver Island. What's next? Like, do you guys have anything that you want, you know, in the pipeline that you can share? Is there markets that you're looking to expand maybe outside of your comfort zone? Like, I know primarily you're in, you know, sort of, I guess, Vancouver, Victoria, you've got some rental product and that stuff over there in uh, the North Vancouver area. Is things like Surrey... Port Moody, Abbotsford, Kelowna, are those on the radar? Or is that something that's even, you've even broached that topic yet? Right now, no. We are looking to remain in the core regions that we know well. And the reason for that is I don't want to spread ourselves too thin. As you say, that we are in so many different types of asset classes. That's how I've diversified ourselves. Um, and we've tried to really centralize knowing Mount Pleasant specifically while we've done four projects there in the past five years. Uh, we continue to poke to try to secure more there. And I would say that's where we have really tried to specialize or diversify is in regions and understanding that, that those dynamics of the neighborhood. And last year, we made two major investments into the Marpool neighborhood, one at uh, Marine and Canby purchasing the Denny site. And we're currently in rezoning for a 573 unit purpose-built rental building with 20% of those below market with a portion of those in partnership with the YWCA. And then also we've got another property in that area for a 90,000 square foot strata office building, which we hope to be launching next summer. And so we make those, we really analyze different neighborhoods. Where do we feel that the trends are going, the opportunity is, and where do people want to live, work? And so we've made a big investment into the Marm Pearl neighborhood, and we look forward to continue to work with the individuals in that area, as well as develop and, and build out those home, those much needed rental homes. And so from that standpoint, we are looking to remain in the same geographical areas where we always poke and look. Of course, I'm a developer. We will always look at new opportunities if the price is right. But uh, right now, our, our key focus is the neighborhoods where we're working. We know really well. You mentioned a 90,000 square foot office building. I'm always curious to get your take from the development side of where do you see office going? Because obviously the pandemic had sort of put a big wrinkle into what maybe people thought from an office market. I'm very bullish on it personally. I think people are creatures of habits. I think it's going to be very hard for companies to be able to retain staff and create corporate cultures that they're proud of if people are meeting each other at the Christmas party for the first time every year. So I'm, a, I'm very bullish on it. And I think we've seen on the leasing side where a lot of people thought that, you mean, they would be giving up their offices. Maybe they gave up a portion of, but then other companies that needed to expand and sort of backfilled that. A lot of tenants that, you mean, were, were running to the hills, you know, they paid their rent and now their position's changing where they are coming back to the office. What is your thought? Because you're obviously literally investing millions of dollars into that, that space. What do you guys foresee as the office space you know, of the future? And, and what is your comfort level in continuing to expand that portfolio into the office market? Uh, Corey, you, you, you always ask very loaded questions. Uh, <laughs> so when, when looking at the general market, even, we, we can't really just... So how is the market? Uh, we need to look at it from a neighborhood asset class user basis. And so I think that the same statement needs to be made with office. I think some different industries will use less office. They have that luxury to be able to work remotely. Maybe it's different departments within offices. However, there's going to be other companies that are going to need more. They're going to need people who have a private office, but also that collaborative space. Yeah. Um, companies are going to need to be uh, look at their design. And quite frankly, I've just done this with our own company because we're about to move offices. And we've done a lot of staff surveys and feedback of what do people uh, want? Um, who wants to be in the office? How often do they want to be in the office? And I think it really comes down to leaders and management of different companies just talking to their staff, talking to what people are looking for, understanding it, uh, understanding where that trend has shifted, where that office space is going to, requirement is going to be. Um, but I do think um, it's going to come back. I do think people are going to want that balance. People will want to work from home and that flexibility. And that's where we're going to see people move around to different companies, depending on the policies in place. Quite frankly, for our company, I hire 
very smart, very sophisticated, very trustworthy individuals, and they can pick their schedule. And, and I would say one, we did a management survey for us uh, recently with our management team. And one of the quotes I love that came back for me was that there's nowhere to hide in our company. And I'm quite proud of that quote because it means we hired every single person for a purpose and that they are here for a reason. And so for that reason, there's nowhere to hide. And, nor, and I, I truly believe a well-run company should be like that. And that that individual can decide if they want to work from home or work in the office. So that's just my general philosophy on the work from home standpoint is that you should trust your employees to make the right decisions and they're going to work hard for you in turn and, and deliver what's needed. So long answer to the question of office isn't going anywhere. Truly believe in it. I think uh, we're going to see industry shift and change. It's going to depend on the user. Uh, we just need to be making sure we design spaces that are flexible, that are uh, people are proud to work in uh, people want to come into the office so i do think class b uh, or call it b minus c class buildings are going to struggle based on your company's hiring policies there matt isn't qualified over here matt so you can't <laughs> apply it chard <laughs> <laughs> would you would you I, be... I spend most of my life hiding <laughs> <laughs> but once he said trustworthy i knew you were out <laughs> so <laughs> do you see chart expanding that office portfolio, it sounds like you're bullish on it. You know, is that something that Char would look to expand further? Is that the confidence level that you guys have? And if you were to expand further, you I mean, is it is it downtown? Is that kind of the office market that you guys foresee blossoming? Or is it something more on the fringe side of things where maybe it's a Mount Pleasant type thing? So I do have one office building downtown, which is it's going to be roughly a 35,000 square foot development. So I'm not going to do the half million square foot project i'll leave those leave that to the pcis the reliances they that is their expertise um i put yeah. those into that category too and so for them let them take on those projects that's not where i sit i sit in the more medium scale office project so that's where we will look essentially between thirty thousand to 90 go up to 100 or 150 on a leasing standpoint uh, strata office for us, it is a you know, typically it's a smaller project of what we try to roll it out. That said, we will that one in in Marpool will be ninety thousand square foot strata office, which I'm quite excited for. Uh, I think it's the right product, right location, will be the right price in comparison to lease rates. So I I do think it comes down to location of what where do we insert ourselves into the developer spectrum. Uh, I think uh, developers are just generalized typically but we're just like car dealers we all have our different offerings and so and we all have our different styles and so that's where uh, i think developers need to be more compared to like cars if uh, if you just said everyone knows what a audi is compared to a toyota for example and so there's different style of developers out there and and that is one that i think is lost sometimes in, in the general public that thirty five thousand square foot one you talked about that's, is, that, is that a project charge doing downtown Vancouver, or is that referring to an existing office project you guys have done? I know that would be one that we've just submitted our development permit on this last week at Pender and Homer. You know, maybe as uh, I just have two final questions for you here, Byron, and, and they're kind of on a different direction. I'm just thinking about the, the purpose built rental component of your, your business. And, you know, I, I work in the, on the residential side, we work with a lot of kind of mom and pop investors, and the ongoing conversation I feel like I have day in, day out is, does it cash flow? And the answer is usually no, it doesn't. And if you want cash flow, you're going to move to a different market. The cap rates are are, are kind of notoriously low here in, in Vancouver and, and I guess increasingly Victoria. You know, at the same time, I'm struck by like pension funds and, and big players always, you know, falling over each other to get into the market here. And presumably your numbers are a little bit different because you're actually building uh, this purpose-built rental. But can you talk a little bit about kind of the, I guess, why you like Victoria and especially Vancouver for purpose-built rental when, you know, the rents and the building cost and the acquisition costs are so high and the numbers are, are kind of lackluster from, uh, you know, if you're looking across uh, the entire country, say? Absolutely. It, it's, I'll put it fairly simple. Vancouver and Victoria are great places to live. People need homes still. And for that reason, I do believe that great cities that offer lifestyle amenities are going to continue to attract individuals. And we are a safe place for a lot of people to move to and, and want to live here. 
So I have the privilege of working with those pension funds. And so I, I completely understand the analogy of the low cap rate and what that looks like. We do build uh, new rentals for pension funds for that very reason, for them to get a yield that is better than what you see a transaction on a cap rate for a property, because we're, we're here to service individual pensions and make sure that return is sufficient to, to fund their pension obligations. But it is a safe investment. And I think that is one that should not be overlooked there. They have mandates to be placing essentially your money, if you have a pension, in a location that's going to continue to earn something to, to feed you into retirement. And so for that reason, that's where rental does offer that security. I also do find that pensions typically move in in packs, I'll call it, and rental was not on the radar for a lot of different pension funds seven years ago. It definitely is today. And that is just because of that security it offers. And typically, they need to find a developer that they want to work with trust to build this out. And I've been very privileged to work with a pension group, and, and I continue to do a lot more with them and build homes. And I think, and at the end of the day, that really helps the different communities here. And maybe as a final question, and it speaks to to what you were just talking about a little bit, but I was actually thinking about this in relation to the dashboard, but uh, risk mitigation, you know, we're, we're clearly coming out of a, a very volatile period over the last 18 months, but also this summer, you know, thinking about climate change in BC and in other areas, just wondering how, how does Chard, I'm just curious to hear about risk mitigation in a world that seems increasingly volatile like how you're you're thinking about that if at all i guess and what that looks like from both like a short term like covid but also longer term like uh the impact of climate change and things like that so risk is something that's always on our radar um uh, as I said earlier, I never want to back ourselves into a corner. And I would say that's why we have so many different assets into different categories, because we've been nimble enough and we have fantastic partners that allow, and that trust us and allow us to look at properties. And maybe it's not the way that we originally underwrote it, but we've allowed ourselves that flexibility and option to pivot in a way that makes the site feasible, uh, that we're able to get construction financing and make the project proceed. And so I think number one is that never back yourself into a corner. Always look at the asset of what is possible. So if you're an, a younger investor or an early investor in commercial real estate and you're buying a small office building, could that office building, in the, are you allowed to stratify it in the future? Is that an option? How are you going to increase that cash flow? What's your disposition strategy? Is it just selling on a cap rate? Uh, what are those options available? Byron, Byron yeah. we got the, uh, we got our, our six pack of questions here, our lighthearted questions to ask you all. So we kind of get to know you a little bit outside of the office. I know we've asked you about, uh, I think on my count here, I got about 1,741 questions so far today. <laughs> do, you, do you have about just five more minutes for us? Uh, absolutely. I find that one of your questions is actually five of them in one. So well, but was, absolutely. <laughs> you, might, you might have to rename the six pack after to just the one pack and then we'll just ask all six really fast. <laughs> the six pack is powered by our friends over at Red Point Law for all your commercial legal needs from commercial closings to commercial leases. And now they have the capacity to do all the work for the developers, Byron. So visit them over at redpointlaw.ca. All right, Byron, you ready? First one I'm up. Ready. Favorite movie? Oh, this is going to be very typical as an accountant, uh, but I'm going to say The Big Short. The Big, you know what? I was going to ask you when you mentioned earlier about the Lehman's break, uh, Lehman's collapse. I was going to ask you, have you seen Too Big to Fail? Yes, I have. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, Big Short, another great movie. The big Short, like, okay. Just Miley Cyrus sitting in the bathtub discussing what a CDO is. It, yeah. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> One book you would recommend, Byron. Maybe it's the same as a movie. That I'd recommend. Um, I'm going to go with what I guess I, I just read. I'm going to go with my latest one I read. Maybe even I love to read different leadership books. I'm a young leader, uh, always trying to improve of how I manage the team, improve our efficiency, our productivity, how I can support people better. Uh, and that was the 15 commitments to conscious leadership. Uh, if people have read it, it's kind of how do I keep myself above the line instead of go below the line of how to be a good leader. Oh, that's a good one. Good one. Quote or inspirational quote that you choose to live by or lead by or lead by or words. Or it doesn't words. have to be or, the exact quote. Could be, could be quotes. It could be words. <laughs> Thoughts. Well, I, Numbers. Yeah, I, 
I already said in this call, um, but treat others the, the same way you want to be treated. Uh, and so that's working with being honest, transparent. I also, also say be vulnerable. That's a good quote. And so that's kind of, I, I think being a vulnerable leader makes you actually a good leader. I actually, I actually was, I was listening to I, the books now slipping my mind. Um, but it was all, it was, uh, oh, what is that book called? It's going to bug me now, but they actually had a, a very good quote for leaders. It says, as a leader, it's not what you preach. It's what you tolerate. Absolutely. A lot of people say one thing and do something completely different. Yeah. Favorite band or song? Oh, I try not to embarrass myself. I feel like for you, Corey, I should just say Nickelback. But oh, uh, yes. <laughs> this, is, this is the I, I, most I, important question see, of and the that entire was wondering talk. Why, before we went on, why you're my favorite developer. I'm like, <laughs> now you know what? Not only am I going to go over and see his dashboard today, we're going to go listen to some Nick, Nickelback today. <laughs> I'm going to say the Killers. Oh, that's a good one. Good one. I, I, aren't they coming to Vancouver? They were just here, I think. They were just they, here. They were just here. Oh, were, were were you were you at that concert, Byron? I was at the beginning of it. I did not stay for the Killers, which I'm still kicking myself for. Now, where was where was the concert held at? Uh, Malcolm Bowl there in Stanley oh. Park. Oh, that'd be awesome. That'd be great. Wasn't Billy Idol just there? Yeah. 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 yeah that'd be great. Favorite vacation spot when you find the time. I'm going to say, I think we live in the best spot. I love to travel. Don't get me wrong. But um, Desolation Sound is such a, a treasure of a location here in, in BC. So by Savory Island. And if you get to go up there, if you go to Nancy's uh, Bakery and get a blackberry cinnamon bun, they're to die for. Oh, my God. Better than Small Victory? No, don't answer that. Don't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> the li- the I, listeners can't... don't realize, but we had about a 15 minute chat before we hit record <laughs> all about small victory and the food. <laughs> and how it threw me off, off track for about six months. <laughs> As I shared, it was, uh, they, they were a purchaser in one of our strata light industrial uh, buildings there in Mount Pleasant. And so we always try to support uh, the different businesses that uh, purchase or are active in our buildings. And so um, that's why I, I got you that gift certificate. Well, if we keep talking about them, we're going to send them an invoice for a sponsorship here pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> Last question for you, Byron, and we really appreciate your time. One piece of advice for anyone listening. Uh, in, this, in this situation, maybe somebody looking to get into the commercial uh, real estate space in, in Vancouver, Victoria. So I'll say two items. Number one, stay true to yourself. Um, uh, just of how you conduct your business. Um, and, and the people you get to deal with. Uh, I was given great advice sometimes in negotiation when some of them I've lost uh, before is we don't always win the negotiations. Um, and one of my partners said to me, um, you probably didn't want to do business with them any which way. Stay, stay to true of who you are and you're going to do business with those type of people and you'll succeed doing that. Um, and I thought that was great advice because there's always another deal. Um, but at the end of the day, it's the people that you're doing those deals with, uh, which will make them... Um, a good experience, but at the end of the day, a good investment as well. Well, one negotiation I can tell you that you win, and it seems to be on an annual basis, is every time I call to buy something, I offer A, and I always pay B. So, <laughs> so. And I always give you the price, and you just yeah. uh, <laughs> it's, uh, most people I think uh, that I hope would feel when uh, dealing with me is I'm, I'm just I'm honest and transparent, and uh, I'll tell you what what I can do and can't do, and. And from there, I'd love to do business with different people, but that's just our approach of of how we uh, life's too short to sit there and, and haggle for a long time. It's uh, this is what we're able to offer. Well, everyone on the, everyone over here is a big fan of what you guys do, and I will say one thing too is 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 having the the you know, being very fortunate to work for Byron over the years and uh, you know buy into the projects with some buyer representation, but also representing them on on the selling side. The quality of product that you guys deliver, building after building after building, is very, very impressive. And I think a lot of people forget that developing is a business at the end of the day. And I, I'm not going to throw anyone under the bus, but some developers probably do it better than other developers. And I just want to say that that we've been very fortunate to work for Chart, and we're very proud to sell the product and buy the product that you guys put out because building after building after building, it just it continues to amaze, and it's just such quality work that you guys deliver year after year. Well, I greatly appreciate that. It's um, one of the best experiences I have is always when we handle the keys and, and walk homeowners or purchasers of Strata office uh, space through the building. Uh, if I can't stand there and be proud of what we've built, why are we building it all? And so that's a really the fundamentals of what we do. 
Uh, so I really appreciate that comment and I'm really proud of the team uh, and the quality that we do deliver and look forward to doing multiple deals with you in the future, Corey. It's, um, we're just getting started. So when I, when I call you for a discount on that 35,000 square feet downtown, remember what I just said? <laughs> your, your, your discount's 10% more. Don't forget that, Corey. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> see, see how good our negotiations always go? I'll probably end up paying 10% more. That's the problem. <laughs> as, as, a final, as a final thought here, Byron, can, can you tell our listeners how people can find out more about what, you, what you're doing over at Chard and, and how they can find out more about Chard development? Absolutely. Uh, so Chard, uh, our website is chardevelopment.com. Uh, please head over there. You can see what we're doing. And as I know Mike Strand said on your last call, I always welcome uh, individuals looking to get into the industry to reach out. Happy to have a conversation of uh, where to go. And I can also offer my direct line at 604-558-7843. Happy to have a discussion with individuals trying to get into the industry. And and uh, any advice I can give is being a young leader and, and how to stick handle uh, a very dynamic, uh, interesting and quite frankly, a fun industry to be in. We get to help shape communities and create experiences that I hope will last for generations to come. And and I think that's something really privileged and and special that I get to do every day. And any listeners that take Byron up on that and go in the office, uh, I'll give you 10 bucks to get a photo of that dashboard and email it to me. (laughs) (laughs) Byron, thank you so much for your time. We know you're super busy. It was a pleasure having you as always. And thank you so much for your insight today. Oh, thank you for both for taking the time. And I look forward to being on once again in the future, hopefully. Sounds great. Thanks so much for your time, Briar. Take care. Absolutely. Bye. Bye. There you have it, folks. Our interview with Byron Chard, CEO, President Chard Developments. One word. Phenomenal. It was a great talk. Oh, he is such an impressive guy. He's uh, very intelligent. I, I very, feel like, very intelligent. You know, guy. I, what I worry about every time I talk with Byron is that I'm asking him the same questions over and over again, which is potentially true. Yeah. But I really, really value his take on everything. And I feel like, yeah, it's just great, great answers. Man. Well, yeah, lots lot to unpack, a lot to think about. Well, there. that's why we ask him six questions at a time. <laughs> Right. We don't ask him a question. We ask him six and then we just sort of sit back and let him unravel them. Yeah, absolutely. No, it was a great, uh, great conversation with Byron. What else do we have uh, before we cut for the day, Corey? People can always, whether they're looking to sell, lease or purchase commercial real estate, they can reach us at williamwright.ca. They're welcome to call me on my cell anytime at 604-839-4173. Or they can email me at corey at williamwright.ca. .ca. And I can see in your eyes, Matt, you're like, that's your cell number. You've I, never done that. I was going to say what this is. I think there's, well, a, there's a new trend. Well, I'm inspired. Commercial I, I feel, I feel, real estate market. I, can people call I, you I, that are just getting into the industry to ask, to pick your anytime. brain? Well, anytime they can call me anytime. And I almost feel that I would just give out our office line, just trying to make it easier for everybody. But then, you know, strand president, <laughs> charge CEO, are giving out phone numbers here. And I'm like, I'm hiding behind my cell number. So I felt the need to give it out. Not- you know what's hilarious is that in the world of residential real estate, there's still guys that, you know, do an average business, nothing super impressive, who refuse to put their cell phones on listings. So you yeah. can't, you have to call their office. They're, <laughs> yeah. they're too yeah. important. And meanwhile, like I, I want to get Byron Chard or, <laughs> or the yeah. president of Strand on the yeah, line. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, I felt inspired to give it away now. So, so <laughs> people can call me anytime with any questions. If they have anything they're thinking about getting into commercial real estate, maybe they're a broker looking to, or an agent that maybe is thinking about commercial real estate, feel free to call email anytime. Always happy to provide any advice for what it's worth. Fantastic. And last but not least, these podcasts do live over at VancouverRealEstatePodcast.com, our website where all things residential and commercial real estate live. I would say as well, we do do transcripts of these of these episodes, which are useful. We also have VIP access to a couple of commercial projects on the live wire, which is our weekly newsletter. So head over to VancouverRealEstatePodcast.com, sign up there, and uh, we'll be back next week. Thanks for listening, guys. Take care. Subscribe today.